Okay, so the Soviet School of Chess. There's a couple of reasons I wanted to have this lecture because when I presented Nimsevich and I presented Alyekhin, I talked about a couple of issues that are kind of touching on uh, what's happening in, in uh, Russia and what's happening in the Soviet Union. And I didn't really develop that. And I think it's important to have a clear understanding of what Russia and what the Soviet Union went through and what the players there went through so that you can understand how they came to dominate chess in the 20th century. I don't think that you can understand players like uh, Botvinnik or Tal or uh, Bronstein or even Karpov, Korchnoi, Kasparov, etc unless you have a clear understanding of the political issues that they were facing and that they're dealing with on a daily basis. So that's what I hope to develop today. Um, I also want to answer a couple of key questions. Number one, uh, who are the major players over the board and behind the scenes? Is there a Soviet style of chess? Is there something that characterizes Soviet chess and distinguishes it from chess played elsewhere? How were politics and chess intertwined? And how did the Soviets become so dominant on the, uh, on the world scene in chess? So again, um, everybody knows who I am by now. Everybody knows who Warren is by now. Um, a little brief history for you. So in October 1917, we had the Bolshevik Revolution, which you're, you may recall from the Alyekhin lecture, Bolshevik meaning majority. It was an uprising of the workers against the bourgeois, against the elite classes, against the nobility. And so anybody who was a member of the no nobility was basically executed, in including Alyekhin's father. And anybody who had a lot of money had their assets seized, like the six estates that Alyekhin's family owned were confiscated, and that money was taken away from him. You may remember uh, Nimzovich when we were talking about how his father was a wealthy merchant. He exported timber, and that family business was shuttered, and their assets were seized uh, by occupying uh, Bolshevik soldiers. And so that forced Nimsevich and Alyekin to completely change their lives. Well, that happened on a much larger scale, as you may imagine, across the entirety of the country. So you have the revolution led by Lenin, um, and you also had the outbreak of the flu pandemic of 1918, which swept really around the world. In Russia, um, about three million people died in World War I, which is a pretty significant number for a country whose pre-war population was 167 million. But then 14 million died from 1918 to 1922 during the Russian Civil War, during the flu pandemic, and also there was quite a bit of typhus going around as well, and famine. So those factors really combined to wipe out a almost a tenth of the population of Russia, which was a huge number by any estimate. So Russia was left shaken. And, um, and because of this, Russian lifestyles had to change entirely. And also, uh, just as a note, Russia became the Soviet Union in 1917. And I may uh, mix the two of them up, just like I may mix up St. Petersburg and Leningrad, the same city, different names depending on the time period. Incidentally, uh, Lenin played chess. And Andy Soltis, who wrote a very good book, maybe the definitive book on the Soviet School of Chess, estimates that Lenin played it around a 1900 rating. So he was certainly no stranger to chess. And like a lot of people, uh, he was pretty good at it and uh, played quite a bit. But when um, after the Bolshevik Revolution, chess was suppressed as an activity of the, uh, of the upper class. And it was not deemed fit, at least initially, for workers. And so all the chess clubs that existed across Russia were closed, essentially, immediately. And chess stagnated for at least a couple of years. Now, Lenin, uh, whose tomb you can still visit, whose body you can still see uh, in Moscow, died in 1924. This was two years after he had resigned leadership. Uh, he had had a stroke in 1922 and then abdicated from power. And Joseph Stalin took over. Joseph Stalin, by the way, not his original name. Um, his, ori his original name is something like Duashvili or something. He's from uh, the state of Georgia. And uh, changed his name to Joseph Stalin. Stalin means steel, by the way. So it's, you know, he's, he's Superman, if you want to think of it that way, as Man of Steel. Um, Stalin assumed power. Now, Lenin did not want Stalin to seize power. In fact, he cautioned 
1924 is basically his last will and testament. He said to the Troika, who was the governing triumvirate, he basically said, don't let Stalin stay in power. Uh, well, jokes on them, Stalin stayed in power, and he's the only one that stayed in power, and he stayed in power for 30 years. So, um, so Stalin, we'll see some of the atrocities that were committed under his reign, but he was extremely effective at holding on to power. He also liked to pretend that he was a good chess player. Um, this is just, history disputes this. They say that Stalin wasn't the brightest of guys. Uh, but Stalin liked to consider himself a master at chess, although he wouldn't play anybody who deemed themselves a master to test his strength um, because he was a, uh, a private person, meaning um, paranoid about appearing weak and losing. And honestly, you would not want to beat Stalin in a game of chess anyway. That would not be a very smart political move. And we do have one game that Stalin supposedly played, but it was probably made up, so uh, I won't bother you with it here. Now, after the Bolshevik Revolution and after the Civil War ended and after the Communist Party established a firm grip on power, players sought to reestablish chess. Now, this was a tough thing to do because, A, most of the people who had played chess under the old regime were bourgeois and they were discredited. And so you, you didn't have anybody who had a, a clean record. And B, it was still considered an activity of the middle class, or the upper class, really, and not something accessible to the workers. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. Most importantly is that there were material shortages all across the Soviet Union at this time. So obtaining a chess set was difficult. A clock was impossible. And even paper. Paper was extremely hard to come by. So there was no real way to publish games or newspapers or columns or anything like that that had been done pre-revolution. Well, this changed somewhat when Alexander Ilyin Genevsky came along. He had a clean revolutionary record. In fact, his brother, his older brother, was an admiral in the Navy. Um, and Genevsky had been in uh, a revolutionary fighter as well. And so he approached the government and said, hey, we should reestablish chess. It will raise people's morale. Um, it will make us look good culturally, you know, internationally. It's a way we can distinguish ourselves. We have strong players. You know, we should do something with that. And um, the and so they tried, uh, and and it mostly succeeded when in 1925 Nikolai Krylenko came along. Uh, he occupied many different positions in the government. He was certainly a member of Lenin's inner circle. He was a chief prosecutor. He was a minister of sport, and so he sponsored chess and incidentally mountain climbing. He was a first-class mountain climber. And, um, and through his benevolence and through his sponsorship, Krylenko was able to establish uh, funding for chess, not only for domestic players in the terms of getting a stipend, but also in terms of attracting people internationally to come play in the, in the Soviet Union in tournaments. That first tournament was in 1925, which we'll get to. So, um, and just for your, your notes, uh, Krylenko ended up uh, getting executed in the 30s during the Great Purge, and Ilyan Ganevsky died in the very beginning of World War II. So not, um, not a good uh, future for these guys. But you see that they were both passionate about it. Ilyan Ganevsky actually was quite a strong player. It, when we look at some of the cross tables, you'll see his name up there in the leaderboard quite often. And so he tried to take chess from the basement of a friend's house where they all played in freezing temperatures in the winter with no light. Luck, maybe they'd have a candle, maybe they'd have a kerosene lamp, maybe not, in their winter coats because there wasn't enough firewood. He tried to take it from that into reestablishing chess clubs, and he was largely successful. So if we look for who the two main people were behind the renaissance of chess in the Soviet Union, we have to think of these two gentlemen. So for our first game, let's actually look at one of the games that Ilyin Zanevsky played against Romanovsky, who's considered one of the strongest players in the Soviet Union uh, in the late 20s and early 30s. We'll take a look at one of their games, and uh, for that, I will turn it over to uh, Warren. There we go. Thanks, Lucas. And uh, also, kudos to Lucas, because I'd actually never even heard of this Zanevsky character before. And, but apparently, he was the best player in 
Russia, Soviet Union, what was it during the time period? Soviet Union. Soviet Union for, what was it, 1922 to 1929? Is that right? He was, like yeah, that. after Yekin's defection, he was certainly one of the strongest, definitely top five. I don't know if he was the strongest or not. Romanovsky might have laid claim to that. And if you count Bogolyubov, who didn't officially defect until 1926, but um, he was certainly one of the strongest. Yeah, so this is a... Uh this guy played a uh, no small part in uh, chess history here, but anyway, so uh, I think this game is pretty cool. Um, now, back to there being a Soviet-style chess. I don't really know if there was a uh, Soviet-style chess per se, but I think there was somewhat of an approach that they all took to chess. Uh, what I mean by that is maybe some kind of common preparation or uh, philosophy towards chess and. I think for Russians, one of them is trying to be relentless, you know, to take kind of the communist, you know, appeal, having an iron fist sort of thing. Um, it, it'll probably make more sense once I show you this game, but uh, I, you know, the only exception to that would probably be Petrosian. You know, he's famous for being a safe kind of player, but in general, I think Russians were, really like these kind of complicated positions where they could try to force a win against our opponent rather than just wait for them to mess up. Anyway, so I'll get started with the game here. So, so far this is a pretty standard Karo Khan. Um, Bishop c4 is pretty ambitious. Now, uh, Black actually played a somewhat risky move here in g6. Now, uh, the safest and probably best move is uh, Bishop f5 here with the idea of just playing e6 and then developing the bishop later. This is safer because you're making the bishop on c4 less of an active piece. And by playing g6, you leave it in a somewhat active post. Now, uh, if black plays bishop g4, white has a, a strong move. Ideally, you'd like to play this kind of move in a Carol Khan, but here it's impossible. Does anyone think they know why? Uh, there's actually two. There's actually two reasonable replies I should mention. Yeah. So if 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 knight g5, then black just plays e6. Now uh, knight e5 is interesting. Um, it's actually not the most precise. Uh, see if you can find what black can do here. Now one move that black cannot do is bishop h5. Do you want to see how white would punish this? Yeah, simply queen takes h5 because f7 is still mate, right? So, see if you can find black's uh, defense here. Queen c8. Uh, queen c8, then I think white will play bishop f7 and then take on g4, and it's still a crushing position. E6. So if e6, then knight takes g4. Okay. I'll, I'll play down. So actually, black has this move queen a5 check, which throws a wrench in things here. So the, the problem is for white now is that f7 is no longer checkmate. And if white plays a move like queen d2, although white's position is by no means bad, black can trade queens and play e6, and black is not lost. Okay. Um, if, for example, bishop d2, see if you can find out what black can do. Black still has a problem here, right? Because g4 is still hanging. Uh, taking the knight, I think, is actually a possibility. Uh, I don't remember if bishop d1. I mean, I think bishop d1 is simpler with the idea of just bishop a5. Uh, or, sorry, uh, bishop d1 is the one that was bad because white has this intermezzo of bishop s7 and then bishop a5 with check. So. Instead of that, black has to take the knight with check, and only then take on d1. And black at least survives, right? At that, I think it's equal here. So knight e5 doesn't work. So here, fortunately though, bishop f7 wins. King takes knight e5, and black's king is weak, and white has extra pawn, so. Anyway, so bishop g4 is not a good possibility. But we'll continue with the game, so g6. Now, uh, 
most chess players today would probably just continue developing with white with castling or something like uh, bishop g5, bishop f4, or something like that. But he played the very aggressive knight g5. Now, first, when I see this move, it looks kind of amateurish. Just saying, oh, I attack f7, I'm going to checkmate you. You're probably too dumb to see that. You know, that's at least what I think. But uh, it actually has a, a nice strategical point. So if, if e6, black's position looks stupid because now the c8 bishop is locked in, right? And all your dark squares are weakened. It looks kind of sad. So knight d5 is really the only logical move here. Otherwise, your g6 was just a bad move. And he just continued queen f3. So this was his point. So black has a hard time guarding f7. He can't, he, the only move he can really play is f6 because if you play a move like bishop f5, then white just plays g4. So this is not exactly a good situation. So f6 is pretty much forced. Now, black is still doing okay here, actually. It's just a little bit tricky to play his position. Now, uh, see if you can find the best continuation for black. Black did not find it. I would suggest just sticking to chess principles. They're pretty much always good to abide by. Over bishop to f5. Uh, bishop f5 does look playable. Um, although I'm not sure if I'm really liking that move so much. I mean, I think white could play a move like c3 and then just castle and black's king is not really in a good situation there. Bishop f5 is not losing it. It looks okay, but black has simpler here. Bishop g7? Yeah, yeah. With the idea of just castling, right? Just developing a piece. Um, I think this is a bit more principled than bishop f5 because you're getting your king to a safer spot. Turns out the e-file is really not a good place for the king. Um, but black was a little bit more ambitious here, probably too much. So he played knight b6. And his idea was that it attacks the bishop and d4. So he's either going to win the pawn or win the bishop. Getting the bishop would be a nice achievement. So white did not want to give him that. So he just sacrificed the pawn. And now, here's where I talk about the relentless part. So, uh, actually, it, it turns out, according to my good friend Houdini, that apparently c3 is the strongest move, followed by just castling and rook e1. And apparently, the fact that black cannot castle because of this bishop causes huge problems. But uh, why decide to go for a little more glamorous approach and just play bishop e3? So, uh, one point is that. If black takes on b2, white has rook d1. And one problem that black has to solve here is that white's threatening bishop d4, queen a3, and then bishop f7, winning the queen. And although black can stop this, it's not, uh, there's not really a good way to. So, for example, knight d5, just bishop d4, and then castle. And black's stuck here. One point is that after, say, bishop g7, rook e1, Black cannot castle because of this check on the knight and winning the queen. So black has too many too many weaknesses here to defend, especially with this king in the center. So black did not take on b2. He just played queen e5. But white continues to develop. And unfortunately for black, white has his knight's tactic winning the pawn back. Now the point is that if queen takes d5, white just has this discovery on the queen. So the rook cannot be taken. But black plays bishop g4. Now, it may look like black is winning the exchange here, but see if you can find out how white saves it. Does knight d6 work? Knight d6. Interesting. I did not consider this. I think the problem is queen takes d6. Yeah, I think queen takes d6 is good for black. Yeah, interesting possibility. That's pretty clever because your idea was e takes and rook would check. But yeah, it looks like black can take. I was confused when I first saw this position because like, it took me longer than I expected. What's that? Yeah, very nice, very nice. So actually the same idea as Brian's move, 
right? So if e takes, rook takes with check. But uh, this time, unfortunately, black's queen uh, does not attack the rook. So white is able to win the bishop this way. So queen c6. Already black's position is already tough to save, but it's nice to see how white finishes off. Just putting a rook on the seventh pretty much always makes sense. And now white has a really, really killer move here. I try to think like a Russian. <laughs> and I don't mean rook e rook bishop e f c. Don't think like that. E7? <laughs> Damn, I think I gave it away with my Russian accent prelude. Yeah, yeah, rook e7. So what's your idea if uh, king takes? King takes. Uh, okay, and then say, uh, what if uh, king f8? Yeah, I think uh, bishop h6 first is probably more precise. Uh, say uh, king g8. I think you're. <laughs> the bishop h6 first. <laughs> you can't say queen takes rook and then, like, oh, no, 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 no. Get confidence in your choice. Russian, remember. Confidence. So, just queen takes pawn, and here it's all downhill, right? I mean, if, if, uh, well, if king g8, then rook d8 is just mating, right? If queen e7, rook d7 wins, right? And if king e8, do you see any easy way to wrap things up? Queen a4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very nice. Queen a4. With the idea that if king f7, rook d7, right? King f6, bishop g7, king f5, and now what? G4. No. I'm not sure. I should have analyzed this. But King G5. Hmm. This is probably winning two. I imagine something like queen b5 probably wins, but maybe there's something more glamorous. I mean, worst case scenario, white could always take on e5 and play f4 and go into this rook ending with three connected passers. But yeah, there might be a more glamorous way. I'm just not sure if I see it here. But yeah, so this is, this is definitely a win. Anyway, so let's go back. So Black saw this, so he did not play uh, uh, King F8. Not that it makes any difference. He just played Bishop C7. Or I think so. Oh, whoops. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got this line wrong. So Bishop G5 first. This was the difference. So uh, this makes a slight difference in the above line. So uh, now it's slightly different, right? If uh, King F8... Uh, white can just transpose, or white can go ahead and take, either way. Anyway, it really doesn't make a huge difference. Uh, he played bishop c7 because there's no other way to save the rook on a8, right? Because he has to move the king to the back rank. And he just resigned here. So after, say, uh, king g... Well, after, say, king g8, how does white win? 
Okay, bishop h6, say uh, queen f6. If rook d8, rook takes d8. Rook, rook d6. I'm sorry, uh, what, what movie are you talking about? Do you want the d6 to attack his queen? Okay, rook d6. Interesting. This probably also wins. Uh, yeah, queen e5, I think queen c4 is pretty... Yeah, I guess rook d6 uh, also wins. Uh, the The prescribed computer solution is rook d7. I'm not sure why, because rook d6 looks pretty devastating too. But there's probably more than one road to, ro road to Rome, basically. But yeah, so uh, this one's pretty clear. Uh, if king e8, it's, it's not complicated, but it's a little trickier. that way. So after rook d8. Oh, but there's a mate. Right. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's tempting, so I'll just play it out. So the, the point here is that black has checkmate. Tragedy, right? Yeah, let's, let's avoid this. <clears throat> it's really not terribly obvious what white can do here, but it's a nice move. Queen G7, I think. What about just Bishop D2? Bishop D2? You need to lock your As you're threatening, you know, so you're saying, you're threatening. Yeah, well, it I'm looks awkward. awkward. It, oh, it's, then you're threatening like you It's probably good, although I'm not... Uh, so king goes to F8, you got Bishop D4. Rook, rook C8 might be annoying, I'm not sure. Bishop d2 is probably still good for white, although I'm not as convinced. Um, here, I'm not so sure if white has anything clear. I mean, regardless, after queen takes a7, white should still be winning because of these three pawns and the black king, obviously. So this still does win, although white has much simpler here. So I'll give you all a uh, hint, so try to take advantage of uh, black's hanging pieces. So which pieces of black are hanging? There's, there's three, technically. Both rooks and the queen, right? Although attacking the queen is uh, maybe obvious, but uh, she's in the middle of the board right now. So I'll make it more specific. Try to Try to threaten this rook and also have another idea in mind. Oh, I see. The C3 square? Yes, yes, yes. Queen C3. Queen the rook. Yep. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the threat of rook E1 and queen H8 is, is unstoppable. If, for example, king F7, then rook E1 rook e followed by rook E7. So, yeah, this. I, uh, it took me a while to see too. <laughs> it was not clear to me why this was winning. But you're giving up a queen on the seventh bottom. It just seems like. What's that? Well, your queen oh, yeah. It's, it's not intuitive because you're moving your pieces backwards. Right. That's one of the things that makes it hard to see. I've, I've had that problem psychologically too in my own games. So, but, uh, that's a good point to make too, right? So, yeah, anyway, uh, that was a pretty nice game. So, back to you, Lucas. So, remember these two names, because they're going to come up again uh, in the late 1930s, early 1940s. So, one of the big problems with the, um, with the Russian chess scene and the Soviet chess scene uh, was that all the greatest players defected. All of them skipped town, basically. 
If you look at the St. Petersburg tournament of 1914, where Alyekin and Nemzovich actually tied for the win, and they both ended up going to the big tournament that Tsar Nicholas II sponsored, where they got the first, where Alyekin got the was one of the original grandmasters. Um, if you look at the list of the people that participated in that tournament and look at the first Soviet championship played in 1920, you'll see exactly two names in common. Although it's not quite obvious um, who the second one is because the names spell differently, but it's Eleven Fish, um, who um, was whose name is spelled differently in, in the other book that I was using. So Eleven Fish and Alyekin are the only names that appear in the cross tables of the last tournament pre played pre World War One and the first tournament played post World War One. So most of the chess talent left town. And now Yakin himself left in 1921, about a year after this tournament was played. So he was gone too, which left Levenfish, and that was it. Um, and so the chess infrastructure in, in the Soviet Union was devastated. Now, it's not surprising why they left. You'll remember that you know, Nimsevich was left destitute by his father's business being confiscated. Al Yikin was left destitute and, um, and saddened by the loss of his father, loss of his mother, and the loss of their family fortune. So it's not too surprising, given the number of people that fled the Soviet Union for the West, and, and by the West I mean typically Western Europe, that, um, that there were so many defections. So when they rebuilt the chess scene in the Soviet Union, they had to not just do it through uh, acquiring funding, but also the talent. Now, slowly but surely, uh, the chess scene reestablished itself in the Soviet Union, and the big break, the big turning point was probably 1925. Um, Nikolai Krylenko secured some funding from the Central Committee of the Communist Party to put on a tournament and to invite strong international players, including Lasker, Capablanca, and, and Marshall, who you'll see here, to come play in the Soviet Union and to participate in a big prestigious tournament. And they brought, um, attracted Bogolyubov back. Now, you'll remember Yefim Bogolyubov for a couple of reasons. Number one, he was in prison with Al Yakin in Baden-Baden after uh, the Mannheim tournament and the outbreak of World War I. Like, they were, they were arrested as Russians in Germany at the outbreak of World War I. And, both, and you'll remember that Alyekin made this long, circuitous journey, circuitous journey back to the Soviet Union, and he joined the army, and he volunteered as a, essentially a medic in a field hospital um, near the front lines. Bogo, however, stayed in Germany. He married a German woman, and he became essentially a German citizen. And he didn't go back to Russia until this point in 1925 when he was invited to participate in a strong tournament. And he went back and he won the tournament um, fairly convincingly over a very, very strong field. And in this, uh, in this tournament, you don't see any strong Soviet players until uh, Ilyan Ginevsky and Bohar Chirchuk, I can't pronounce that one, um, and Levenfish, obviously, but you don't see them until further down the list. So the strongest players were still um, non-Soviet players for the most part. By the way, you'll also see Fyodor Dusko-Dumirsky, if you remember him, he was one of the teachers of Alyekin, like went to his house and, and gave him private lessons. Um, so you'll see him at number 20 there. So pretty strong field, pretty prestigious, and this did a couple of things for Soviet chess. Number one, it inspired a lot of people. Um, some of the chess players, like Capablanca, did other events on the side while they were there. Capablanca played a simul in St. Petersburg, and he played 14-year-old Mikhail Botvinnik, actually. And Botvinnik, at 14 years old, took a game off Capablanca, and according to Bo uh, Botvinnik, Capablanca threw the pieces off the board in frustration after the loss. Um, it was also watched by a 16-year-old named Ilya Khan, we know the Khan Sicilian, and by a 19-year-old named Vasily Panov, we know like the Panov attack or the Panov Botvinnik attack, as it was also called. So this inspired a younger generation of Soviet chess players. That was very important. Also, it changed public perception of the Soviet Union. Grunfeld, there's an interesting story of Grunfeld. He came to this tournament with a suitcase absolutely full of canned food because he was convinced that if he didn't, he was going to starve because rations were still in great effect in the Soviet Union, and they were um, until the 80s, honestly. But 
the organizers pulled out all the stops, if you will, and um, fed the players well, lodged them well, and for the first time, some of these Soviet players had access to things like sugar, which they hadn't seen in almost 10 years. So uh, it was a big deal for them, too, to, uh, to get that prestige. So this was a, this was a turning point for uh, Soviet chess, and it, it certainly, uh, after this, the level improved. Now, we're talking about Bodmanik. He established himself very early as a strong player. He took a game off Capablanca in a simul at the age of 14. Here he is at the age of 16 in the fifth Soviet championship, and he places tied for fifth and sixth uh, with Romanovsky, whose game we just saw, by the way, and with Duz Kodimirsky, um, the old um, tutor of, of Aliyekin, and with Ilya Janevsky here as well, doing quite well. And you may recognize um, Vilner down there. Does anybody remember who Vilner was? Vilner was the clerk who uh, saw the death warrant for Al Yakin and convinced his boss, who was the head of the secret police in the Ukraine, to intervene and save Al Yakin from the firing squad back in 1919, I believe. So Vilner was, was still around and playing and quite a strong player in his own right. So we recognize a couple of the names there. Um, obviously, Badvinik jumps to mind because he ended up being the strongest of all those on that list. Um, and I think Rouser, by the way, is also known as, is it a Richter Rouser attack? Yep. Yeah. Um, so he's there, he's there as well. So we see some names there that we recognize. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, Botvinnik. Dr. Botvinnik, um, he had a doctorate in electrical engineering. You should know that all of the players who played in the Soviet Union during this time were not professional chess players. That was forbidden. They did receive a stipend from the government, all of them except Levenfish for some reason. The, the government didn't really like Levenfish. But the others received a government stipend, which allowed them some measure of, of luxury, comparatively speaking, compared to other Rus Soviets, not necessarily compared to the West. Um, and the strong players were allowed to do things that normal citizens couldn't do, like they could leave the country from time to time to participate in tournaments, and that was really unheard of. Um, but otherwise, they had to work full time. Uh, Botvinnik was a an electrical engineer, and he worked in that capacity all of his life. Um, so Botvinnik was born to a fairly bourgeois family, right before the revolution. His father was a dental technician. His mother was a dentist. Both parents were Jewish. So Botvinnik was raised Jewish, which is interesting because the Jews faced quite a bit of persecution in the Soviet Union at various times in the early 1930s and in the late 1940s, and Botvinnik seems to have come through that relatively unscathed. Now, he started learning chess at the age of 12, so somewhat late, I guess, compared to some people, but uh, by the age of 14, he took a game off Capablanca. In two years, he progressed from what was considered third category to first category. So he went somewhere from the equivalent of, say, 1,400 to 2,000, by our current reckoning, maybe, in the course of two years. That's a meteoric rise, really. And he did it in a very strange way. He didn't, he kind of shunned the chess club. He didn't necessarily, he grew up in, um, in Leningrad. He didn't really go to the chess club there to learn from the old masters, like Romanovsky and Duz Kodomirsky. He, he learned from books, particularly from Chagorin. Chagorin and Capablanca were two of the biggest influences on Botvinnik. So, um, incidentally, the other guys who he kind of scorned, they kind of shunned him in return. Uh, so he wasn't very popular among the, chess, uh, the, the other chess players, particularly at the time, but he ended up distinguishing himself by doing extremely well. Um, so, Botvinnik distinguished himself, and by 16, he was uh, one of the strongest players in the Soviet Union, and he was recognized as a master. Now, um, in 1926, he got a rare opportunity to play outside of the country, and he went and played in Stockholm in Sweden. And um, he was dubbed the Soviet Alyekin. So Alyekin was Russian, but he was not necessarily Soviet, if you want to think of it that way. He defected in 1921, so he was called, this was by the head of the Swedish uh, chess Federation, the president of the Chess Federation, the Soviet Alyekin, meaning the Soviet's best chance to win a world title. And that was somewhat 
uh, prescient. It, it turns out it, it, that turned out to be true. Now, while he was in Stockholm, young Botvinnik got his first, and remember, he's 15 at the time, he sees um, things that he's never seen before, like glasses are widely available. He bought a pair of glasses in Stockholm, and that was like the first pair he had, he had had in years, because the, the sort of thing just wasn't available in the Soviet Union. Uh, bought a pair of glasses and a hat. He stuck with the glasses. He didn't, he didn't particularly enjoy the hat, though. And so he, and he, he actually considered defecting to Sweden at the time. Remember, Bogol Yobov has defected officially to Russia, or sorry, to Germany in 1926. And Al Yakin has already left, and a lot of other people that Botvinnik maybe saw when he was younger, they have left. So he's, he thought about it, but he stayed. And he became a, a, a pretty fervent uh, communist and stayed that way. So uh, that was his last um, temptation, I suppose. Now, Botvinnik played against every major chess player of the 20th century. You name him, he played him because he had such a long career. And he also coached many of them. He coached Kasparov, he coached Karpov, he coached Kramnik. Um, but still, Botvinnik was um, stubborn, really, really stubborn. Um, Sosanko, who wrote the, the, the World Champions that I knew, one of the books that I brought with me and used, uh, he relates an anecdote where Botvinnik would hold a grudge, and if you pissed him off, he would write down your name, and your name would not be spoken in his house, and he would not speak to you for a preset period of time. One time, Sasanko was over at his house for dinner, and, the, and he hears uh, Botvinnik talking on the phone. And Botvinnik says to the other person on the other end, he says, what's today's date? May the 8th? Okay, then I shall not talk to you until May the 8th of next year. Hangs up the phone. So if you ticked him off, you were persona non grata, and he had enough power by the end of his, uh, well, by really the, the beginning, middle, and end of his career that he could get away with that. Um, and while, every, while everybody else was getting threatened by the government, uh, Botvinnik was, was writing them you know, nasty letters, and they'd bring him in and say, okay, you can't, you know, you gotta tow the party line, and he'd be like, all right, all right, and then he'd send another angry letter. So, and he could get away with it. He was considered the, the patriarch. Everybody called him Comrade Misha, uh, Misha being a, uh, kind of a pet name for Mikhail. So he, he was, I guess, the godfather of Soviet chess. If you want to pick anybody to uh, hold that honor, it would certainly be uh, Botvinnik. And the last 19 years of his life, interestingly enough, I put pioneer of computer chess. I choose pioneer on purpose because the computer chess program that he uh, coded was called pioneer. He led a team of uh, mathematicians, computer scientists, you know, as an electrical engineer himself, to program a computer to play chess, and he spent almost two decades on it. He wrote papers on it. He presented conferences. That's him presenting at McGill University in 1977. He was a big proponent of it and uh, thought that it was going to be, you know, the training tool of the future. And what he wanted to do was to train a computer to think like a chess master, essentially artificial intelligence. Now, that's not what we have today. What we have is brute force. Uh, the Western programmers, particularly the Americans, were m moving towards a more brute force method, capitalizing on um, Moore's law, which says that the number of processors will, will uh, sorry, that processing power will double approximately every 18 months because of the number of transistors you can put on a computer chip. They were benefiting from that increased computing capacity to make brute force the preferred method of chess computing. Botvinnik, toward the, even to the end of his life, was working for the opposite, uh, which was a smart, if you will, computer program. Um, and the, uh, the last thing I want to tell you about Botvinnik is he had very stubborn views on chess as well. He believed that chess was serious business and you had to prepare, 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 like Warren was saying earlier, and that you had to work really, really hard. Um, you know, people would ask him, you know, was your game fun or are you having fun? And he'd say, fun? What does fun have to do with anything? You know, and, and he, was a, he was a big believer that blitz would lead to the destruction of chess as we know it, that it was sacrilege, if you will. And um, reportedly, he played one blitz game in his entire life, and that was when he was on the train. 
Um, other than that, he would scoff at people, even Kasparov in, in the 80s, he would scoff at them for playing blitz and playing rapid chess and thought it was uh, you know, a corruption of what would otherwise be a beautiful game. So speaking of beautiful games, let's see a beautiful game played by Botvinnik in 1945 against who was perhaps the best American chess player at the time, uh, Dinker, who we, uh, a name we, we know quite well. So again, I will turn it over to Warren for that part. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah, but before I show the game, actually, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the whole Soviet style. So uh, Kasparov mentions about uh, Botvinnik being like the kind of, like he mentioned, I don't know if he used the exact word, godfather of Soviet chess, right? But uh, one of the things that he also mentions is that you know Botvinnik was very... Uh, strict on his routine for his students. He wanted them to annotate their own games, the games of the strongest players of the day, and especially annotate the games of their rivals. Now, by the way, I should mention, annotate means go over, analyze, comment, right? This move was good, my move was bad, like something like that, right? So uh, he was very strict about that. And uh, like he mentioned about Vinick's hatred for blitz chess, he almost disowned Kasparov uh, early on in his career when he went to play in a uh, European junior uh, tournament. And the time we trolled for that was game in 60, game in an hour. And Botvinnik did not want him to go and play at all. He thought it would be bad for his chess. He didn't see any benefit. And Kasparov went ahead and went and played anyway. But you know, I guess Botvinnik didn't really hold too long of a grudge. Kasparov won the tournament. and. You know, I guess Botvinnik didn't mind claiming him as his own student. So <laughs> turns out he held no grudge against him for that. Uh, but that was just kind of a taste of his views. And he was also strict not just in the chess, but also on their physical regimen. He, for all of his students, he wanted them to exercise regularly in the morning every day. Tennis, walking, jogging, something like that. And he was also a big proponent of fish. Thought they had to have a nice, uh, big... You know, well, fish preferably could be some other meat, like a big lunch, basically. So he was very strict on these things. I don't know how he came to these conclusions, but no, he's probably right. I mean, being in good physical condition is pretty important. So uh, I can understand that part of it. And not only was he big on annotating people's games and having a strict physical regimen and uh, proponent of long time controls, he, he also was a huge fan of preparation analyzing openings especially and uh, this game features uh, one of his pet openings which bears his name now um, it's called the Bopinik system well uh, you call it the Bopinik system here it's more usually referred to as the Bopinik variation of the Slav so we'll get to it in a minute here so with this risky move D takes C4 is where the line starts now, this is the last point where black can derivate. Uh, black can play h6, try to enter into a Moscow. But b5, this is the Botvinnik variation here. And this is pretty much, uh, you could debate it, obviously, but I'd say it's probably the most complicated opening in chess. And that also tells you a little something about the uh, Russian standard, or Russian propensity for complex positions. Botvinnik liked it conceptually because since it was so complicated, it meant that he could prepare it very deeply and just crush his opponents with his homework. So uh, he wanted to create positions where his opponents couldn't easily understand and improvise. And as we can see with Denker, that actually proved to be the case. Uh, so let's continue. You'll understand why it's so sharp in a second. So Black has a big problem here. Knight's pin can't move, so it's pretty forcing. H6 is the only move to maintain the piece. And this is actually a, a somewhat real pawn sacrifice from black, because white just won two pawns, and white is still going to win this knight. So knight d7. And uh, now comes a point where theory would have helped. So either now or on the next move, uh, theory, modern day theory, suggests that g3 is the best method of playing here, with the idea of putting the bishop on this long diagonal and counteracting black's bishop. And it also really helps provide protection for the white king, just having an extra piece around it, and also shielding 
uh, white from this diagonal, which can be helpful. But anyway, Denker did not know any of this. This was still in its infancy. I actually don't uh, know how many times it's been played before. You know, I did not research the history of this, but this was pretty uh, new territory back then. So anyway, he played bishop b2 instead, which it is playable, it's just meek. It's, it's not very impressive. Uh, and in my database, the results are pretty bad for white. Uh, black scores about 50% wins, 25% draws, and 25% win for white. So that means if you had like four games, then black's going to win two, white's going to win one, and that's going to be a draw. So just from that, you can tell this is probably not a very good line. But this is what Botvinnik wanted. He wanted uh, to force his opponents to toe a thin line. So let's look at what happened here. It's pretty impressive. So with a4, white was trying to break up the black pawns and try to open up the black king. But uh, Botvinnik not only mines, he facilitates this. c5. <laughs> uh, the main point here is that he's opening up the light squared bishop on b7. And that's more important than any possible weakness he could incur to his king. So uh, I'm, here it's already kind of tricky to say what white's best is. Uh, queen c2 probably would have been slightly better. Uh, but they're really about the same in terms of their value. So here's another point where white could have improved. So uh, f4 probably would have been a better choice. Uh, it turns out that uh, the knight on g3 is not really helping white's cause here. Uh, it causes some problems because white's king doesn't have access to that square. It may not seem relevant right now, but you'll see in a minute here. So, anyway, knight g3 takes. Now white gets rid of at least one of these black pawns marching down the board. The point here is that black cannot take the bishop because of rook c1, pinning the queen to the king here. So that's not at all an option. But although black's position looks scary, he starts attacking. See if you can find how black uh, gets the initiative here. It is a really simple position, so you should be able to find it pretty quickly. Uh, knight e5. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I think knight e5 might be possible, but, uh, you know, just something like uh, bishop b5 looks kind of problematic. Rook c1 is the idea. Um, you'll you'll see why I say bishop b5 in a minute too. Uh, also, something like bishop f4 seems quite fine too. Uh, yeah, king b8 is possible, but uh, it turns out black has a more active alternative. Bishop c5. Uh, bishop c5. That's probably also okay, although I think white can play a move like bishop d3 and follow it up with rook c1 and bishop e4. Uh, bishop c5 just looks a little bit too passive. D3 looks tempting, but it's not. Uh, d3 is interesting. I think. Yeah, I think I think d3 bishop takes is a problem because white's going to try to trade bishops and play rook c1. Uh, queen, queen c6. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, it, it may look kind of it may look kind of uh, like amateurist in a way because it's threatening checkmate one, which white can easily stop, right? But uh, one nice point of this is that it opens up another diagonal because white's white hand is forced. White has to play f3. There's no other way of guarding mate. And the advantage here is that now you open up a new diagonal for white. Now, uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with mating patterns, but this is a very common one where, uh, well, I won't spoil it, but you'll see in a minute here. So the exposure of this, this dark square diagonal is pretty important in combination with an open H file. Okay. Um, but anyway, the, to, to see a move like queen c6, uh, now I, I actually don't know what the evaluation of the position is after the move like say king b8, but 
a move like Queen C6 is something that I would myself probably almost always play just because it's a nice one move threat. It may sound kind of stupid, but uh, that's actually a, a good way to figure out uh, a good continuation. So what I mean is a move like Queen C6 improves your piece with tempo, basically, right? So that kind of move should always be good. That's the way I would look at it anyway. So anyway, queen c6, f3. Now black plays d3, opening up this diagonal. Uh, here, I think a better approach would have been, what was it? I think a better move was be bishop e3, if I remember correctly. Just trying to keep control of this diagonal, because after queen c1 is just rather passive. Um, I think bishop e3 is just bad here because of d2 and knight e5, and black's going to win this piece. So unfortunately, white cannot just block the bishop, and king h1 is forced. Now queen d6. The the clouds are gathering, right? <laughs> now queen f4. Now uh, see if you can find the best path for black now. Wow, found that quickly. <laughs> What's that? He's just studying practice and tactics and went through a lot of important. Yeah. So this is the mating pattern that I was referring to. It's, it's really common when this diagonal has been opened and g3 is not available that you have these sacrifices on the h-file happen. So white has a big problem here. There's no easy way to uh, block this traffic. So a move like knight h5, giving up the piece, fails because of rook takes, king up, and rook g5. And it's pretty devastating. So. There's not really much choice. If bishop h4, just queen takes queen, right? He played queen h4, but it was no better after this. And white's losing the bishop as well, and getting checkmated. So this is a pretty impressive route in Denker. 25 moves as black. I mean, it's... Uh, and you can really attribute a lot of it to the the opening and Bobinick's preparation. So. Denker was just completely unfamiliar with this, and, and Botvinnik, by his own claims anyway, had put in hundreds and hundreds of hours into studying this. So I'm not sure how true that is or not. It, it might be. But uh, this kind of goes to what I was saying before about preparation, preparation, preparation. So, yeah, Here, that's... How do you make up the pitch? I mean, are you just winning or do you have the actual mate? Uh, yeah, I don't think black can force mate that I see. I think probably just like queen takes bishop. Well, if, well, I guess what I'm wondering then is couldn't you throw in queen takes queen before all the rook sacks? Let's see. You mean right here? Yeah. So the point is that white has knight h5, so if, say, check now, white has knight h5. Oh, make him pull there. Okay. Yeah. Well, this this might, oh no, White is up the exchange, so yeah, this is probably yeah. So yeah, I think Rook takes H2 is definitely clear there. But yeah, so it, this this almost came out of nothing. I mean, White doesn't really look like White did anything wrong. White just had a couple of easy moves, but other than that, White didn't make any obvious mistakes. But he still just got wiped off the board because Bob Vinny understood his position so nicely. Or you do the attacking theme of opening up the light squared bishop with c5 despite exposing his king, kind of counterintuitive in a way, and then moving his d-pawn up the board so he can clear the way for his other bishop. And from there, it was just a devastating attack. So, yeah, that's all I had for that. Back to you, Lucas. So let's talk politics. In uh, 1934, Sergei Kirov, who many expected would be Stalin's successor, uh, he was the Communist Party chief in uh, Leningrad, the second most important city in the Soviet Union at the time. He was murdered. And um, many contend, and 
historians are still on the fence about this, but they suspect that Stalin actually ordered his murder and had the secret police assassinate him. And uh, what happened is, on the day of his murder, Stalin announced new measures to protect the security, supposedly, of the uh, Soviet Union. The main um, proclamation that he made was that anyone who was found involved in anti-revolutionary activities would be tried, or could be tried, and executed immediately. And what this led to was a series of show trials where high-ranking party officials were tried, confessed to some sort of activity which undermined the Soviet Union, and then they were executed, you know, uh, taken out back and shot essentially immediately. And most of these confessions were obtained under torture. This led to a period of time in the Soviet Union which we call the Great Purge, widely considered to be um, from the time period of 1934 when Kirov was, was murdered until 1940 when the purge ended pretty much out of necessity because of World War II. Now, there were not just high-ranking communist officials were killed, tried and killed, lots and lots of people were killed. Even the people who killed the people were them, themselves killed. I'm reminded of the opening scene in Monty Python, The Quest for the Holy Grail, when they say, we have sacked the people responsible, and then, then the next credit says, we've sacked the people who sacked the people. That's what happened. Um, one of the main pro leaders of this purge was Yeznov, who was the leader of the Soviet secret police. In fact, the NKVD is the predecessor of the KGB. And you probably didn't know this, but Photoshop existed in the 1930s because after he himself was purged, he was taken out of photos as well. That's, that's what happened. These people were not just removed from power. They were disgraced. They became non-persons. And uh, their bodies were consigned to mass graves. And we estimate that during the height of the Great Purge, which was 1937 and 1938, 650,000 people were executed. That was about a thousand people per day. In fact, reportedly Stalin gave his local governors quotas on the number of people that needed to die. And it was their job to go out and find the people to kill. And it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just high-ranking communist officials, it was also peasants who were considered too wealthy. If you look to be doing too successfully as a farmer, then your crops and everything else were seized and you were executed, with the result being that no farmer wanted to appear, to appear too successful, so they planted less, which led to a famine, which killed a further six million people. So, um, I guess an unintended consequence, but this was devastating, even for a country as large as the Soviet Union, again, with a population around this time of around 150 million. This was devastating. and. It happened at, at the highest levels. Out of the original revolutionaries, of which Stalin himself was a part, Stalin was the only one who lived through this period. Everybody else who was still alive was executed. Uh, so only Stalin remained. He had absolute control of power. I put the marshals of the Soviet military there. These guys are like five-star generals. They're like the chief of staff of the respective uh, military divisions. Three of those five were purged. The result being that the Russian army was left in a kind of a limbo. And in 1938, that was kind of unfortunate because war was coming. So when you look at the problems that the Soviet Union faced in the Second World War, part of it starts with the, uh, the Great Purge. And this is one of the this was one of the saddest chapters of the history of the Soviet Union. It's not just people who were executed. This is also where the gulags, the prison camps, come in. A lot of people were forcibly removed, you know, millions of people sent to prison camps in Siberia. Many of them died of exposure or starvation in those prison camps. This was a very, very tough time. Now, some people were simply stripped of their membership in the Communist Party. Those purges happened quite often, actually. Um, Stalin just kicked it up a notch by executing people. But those purges had been occurring for a while, so if you were kicked out of the Communist Party, 
you lost any governmental benefits that you might have had, and you also lost the ability to participate in local or regional governments. So many people were, were purged from the roles of the Communist Party, and uh, a good number were also purged from the planet, essentially. So it was a, uh, a sad time, and also it, it, it took the, um, the life, when we're talking about chess, of Nikolai Krylenko. Nikolai Krylenko, who was kind of the sponsor of chess in the Soviet Union, had been a member of uh, Lenin's inner circle, and the chief prosecutor for a number of years was himself arrested, accused of anti-government activities, tortured, confessed, and executed summarily. No real chess players were purged during this time, although they found it almost impossible to obtain a visa to travel internationally and play, nor did any of them really want to because any ties to the West and to the enemies could be perceived as a, uh, an anti-government activity, and so no chess player really wanted to travel and, um, and risk that. So instead, they kept their tournaments within the Soviet Union, and the strongest chess players in the Soviet Union during this time period were uh, Botvinnik, obviously, uh, Karas, who we've not talked about yet, but will soon, Smyslov, who uh, you might recall was world champion as well, and we'll get to also. These were the strongest players in the Soviet Union, and likely the strongest players in the world at this time. Um, Alyekin was still officially world champion. Ova had been world champion. Uh, Capablanca was still around and playing. There were some strong Americans like Dinker and Ruben Fine and Samuel Ryshevsky, but probably these three players were the strongest in the world, but nobody really knew that outside of the Soviet Union because they didn't travel and compete, and news did not get out of the Soviet Union at the time. So let's talk, we've talked a bit about Botvinnik. Let's talk about our number two guy here. Uh, let's talk about Karras. So Karras was uh, Russian by birth, and when I say Russia, I mean the Russian Empire because he was born in Estonia in 1916 before Estonia achieved independence in 1918 or 1919. But Estonia was annexed by the Soviet Union during the Second World War, and Karras, unwillingly essentially, became a Soviet citizen, kind of against his will. He didn't have much of a choice there, but he um, became one. And the reason he didn't really like that is because in, as an Estonian, he had the ability to travel all over, participate in international tournaments, had no trouble participating in Germany or in France or in Spain or even in Buenos Aires in Argentina. But once he became, during the World War II, when he was forced to uh, seek refuge essentially from the German advance, uh, in Moscow, he was essentially forced to become a Soviet citizen and participate in Soviet tournaments from then on. Uh, he went on to become the the champion of the USSR. I say USSR because after World War II and after they annexed Estonia and all the other Baltic states, they became the USSR as opposed to the Soviet Union. He was USSR champion from 40, you know, 1947, 1950, 1951. He was often mentioned as a um, as a competitor or a candidate to face Al Yakin. In fact, in 1938, after Karras won the Avro Tournament in Holland, he was widely considered to be the top contender with Al Yakin. That match never happened. It couldn't be arranged and occur before uh, World War I began, be, begun and began, sorry, in 1939. Chess did continue. You saw on the previous slide that uh, chess did continue during in the Soviet Union during World War II, although in a curtailed fashion. You saw the date on that was 1941. It occurred a couple of months before the Soviet Union itself was invaded by Germany. So to get to know Karras a little bit better, let's look at one of his games. This was against uh, Geller in 1962. Karras had a long and illustrious career. Let's look at one of his better games from uh, 1962, well after the fall of the, uh, uh, the end of World War II and the, the beginning of the USSR. All right, so uh, Karras was, this is kind of been doing injustice to showing one game, but in general he was a pretty sharp player. So he was one of those guys who you would definitely call a good representative of the Soviet school of chess. Uh, very romantic kind of player, uh, and 
this game I'm showing you right here was played in 1962, so he was 46 years old. And this was a uh, candidate's playoff game, actually. So Kyrus and Yeller were tied for second in this tournament they had played in with uh, Botvinnik, actually, or no, Petrosian. And Petrosian won this tournament. And the importance of second place, the reason why they were playing a mini match and playoff for second place, is that the second place in this tournament qualified for the candidates in 62. And so this was pretty important, especially for Karras, because he was 46. He was an older guy, so he didn't really have a whole lot of opportunities left. And there was just one game here between him and Yeller to decide, Yeller, to decide who became the candidate for that. So that just frames the competitive importance of this game right here. It was huge. So let's get started. So kind of a non-traditional opening. You're not really going to see this very often today. Um, whoops. So this is kind of a, tra a tarash, but it transposes, interestingly enough, into a kind of uh, Panoff Botvinnik, uh, isolated queen pawn kind of position. So the modern day treatment of this position would be to play like C takes D4 here, followed by perhaps Bishop E7 and the idea of just playing against this isolated queen pawn. But uh, back then the fashion was more to play what Geller did and take on c3 and go for this instead. So as you can see, white has a nice big center, so this was not something Karras objected to. But uh, this is somewhat principled for black at least because you have no real weaknesses. Now here's a pretty important point. So, uh, so Geller played bishop before. Uh, it turns out this was uh, not the most precise move. Uh, a move that's kind of hard to find, and the reason may not be obvious why it's better is uh, bishop f6 would have been an improvement here. And I don't know if that makes sense, but it'll make more sense when you see White's uh, reply to Black's move in the game. But the idea basically is to. Uh, restrain white's center with the idea that if white pushes the e pawn, then he gives up the d5 square. If he pushes the d5 pawn, or the d4, d4 pawn, then black can trade pieces. And trading is always good if you have less space, especially if your opponent has attacking chances. But going back to the game, uh, this is a pretty important position. So uh, looking at white's position, uh, what do you think white's advantage is here? Yeah, the two center pawns are really nice, right? White obviously owns the center. Bishops are on nice diagonals. There could be nice diagonals. They're blocked, but look how nice <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a great point, by the way. <laughs> I mean, the, just the basic where his pieces are. I mean, the, the bishop on b4 and the knight a5 are both a little, a little bit like... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess he's... Yeah. I guess he's I mean, I guess the idea is to play bishop c3? Mm hmm exactly. Exchange it? Or? So, uh, you know, white's pieces are just more coordinated, I guess if you could sum it up in one word. Uh, so one problem is white is a little bit ahead in development, right? White's rooks are connected, uh, black's rook on f8 is still doing nothing, the 9 and a5, like Brian mentioned, uh, and black's trying to find some role in the game for his dark squared bishop. That's why he played bishop b4, so he could trade it off, actually. Um, but even though White has his nice position, uh, the strong center isn't really do doing anything for him right now. Uh, you want your center to restrict your opponent's pieces, and they are doing that. But Bishop Black's Bishop on B7, for example, it does attack E4, so it's not pointless. And if you give Black the move here, for example, then Black will play Bishop C3, and it's probably going to be about equal. So even though White's position is very nice. Uh, it's not going to stay that way. So, see if you can find the, the principle to apply for white. And I, I think there really is only one principle to apply here. So, 
so a rook c1 I don't think is a good idea because it goes against what you want to do, which is you're exchanging pieces, right? Yeah, I think d5 is the only real principled move. Now, here in this position, I, I think it's justified to take the tall approach and not calculate because any other reply is just uh, not going to take advantage of what is better about your position. About here, it's white's placement of pieces. So that's a dynamic advantage. It's not a permanent one. So you have to take advantage of it while the iron, you have to strike while the iron's hot to be, you know, cliche. So that's the point of d5. Now, you know, Karish did not calculate this himself. He just assumed it had to be right. Turns out he was correct, okay? Uh, so the point is, my, it's probably obvious, it's just to open up the bishops, right? The b2 bishop, and if black takes on b5, the last square bishop too. So you open up two bishops with one move, basically. So it's very efficient in getting your pieces operating. So, uh, by the way, I want to make uh, one other point about uh, rook c1, which Lucas mentioned. So, uh, what was I going to say? So, well, specifically, black can play queen e7, and with the intention of playing bishop a3 and trading pieces. But, uh, what was I going to say? So it doesn't give white control of the c5, essentially? Uh, yes, yes. So, well, you, your idea is pretty logical because you're trying to stop back from playing bishop c3. Correct, and you yeah. can take advantage of the only open file on the board. Yeah, so, uh, oh, that's the point I was going to make. So, exchanging pieces in general is bad for white here, I was going to point out, because if you strip all the pieces off the board, when you leave yourself just kings, it's a, a lost endgame for white. Because black has the outside pass pawn. So when you look at this kind of position, you strip all the pieces away and realize that the, that lets you know that you have to play for uh, the middle game, basically. So that's the only point I was going to mention. Not that rook c1 instantly implies that all the pieces are going to be traded here to lose. But it's something to keep in mind in these kind of positions. Uh, I don't know whoever told me to do that, but that is a useful thing to keep in mind in positions. If you ever just strip all the pieces off the board, who wins? That'll give you an idea of what you need to play for. So, anyway. So d5. Of course, black also plays the pencil for pi, just taking the pawn. Now, uh, black can't get too ambitious and take the pawn outright, because if bishop takes d5, then how does white proceed here? Uh, bishop h7, bishop h7 probably wins, although I, th I think white must have simpler. Yeah. Uh, queen e5, I think f6, I'm not entirely sure what's going on here. I mean, I imagine white is certainly winning after, say, queen h5, but, uh... I think white probably has something here. Can you play bishop e4? Uh, bishop e4? I don't know if black can get away with bishop c4. I mean, this is probably also fine for white after, say, like queen e3. Uh, because I think white can actually take on h7 and play knight g5, perhaps. But no, I, I think white has easier. Take check. What was that? In the bishop c4 line, I think you can just take, him and take on h7. Take here? No, take on h7. Oh, okay. Oh, you might be right. Yeah, then just queen e4. Well, I don't know, it may not be so simple. And if you play queen c2, black has this. Another going. Any other ideas? Suggestions? So I, I think uh, I should have probably confirmed this with the computer, but I think bishop a6 is probably one of the simpler. Uh, with the idea that you're threatening uh, queen e5 and the rook. When you can't move c4, c4, 
What's that? Bishop c4. Here? I think at bishop c4, bishop takes. But yeah, so uh, I think white probably has bishop a6 is one. I think uh, queen e5 to h5 is also a definite win. So d5 is not really touchable there. If queen takes, obviously, just bishop h7 wins. So that's why I play queen e7. And of course, white doesn't want to trade queens, so knight e5. Also, unlocking this diagonal for the queen. Uh, here, I don't know if black had any uh, significant improvements. It's kind of difficult already. Uh, like, one possible line could go bishop takes d5, queen h5, g6, and now white has this kind of cool move in knight g4. <laughs> yeah, kind of cute idea, right? Um, so this is yeah, so white. White's conception is that this is checkmate. It, it's kind of, I would say unique, but there is a, a line sim in the Nimzo Indian which is similar, and it's kind of tough for Black because a move like f5 doesn't even stop it. It's still checkmate. So I think forced is Bishop c3, and then. White just wins a piece. So, unfortunately for Black, I really don't know if there's any way to improve. He played f6. Of course, you can imagine White's reply: Queen h5, g6, the only move. Knight takes. And here, uh, see if you can find what White did. What's that? Can you take the pawn with f6 with the bishop? Uh, I think rook takes. Oh, which does rook takes? So you guys think queen takes checkmate? Oh, yeah, yeah. If uh, <laughs> That would be a swift end to the game. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Rook takes. So white's bishop and queen are pretty nicely placed. It's kind of hard to approve those. What other pieces can you get into the attack? Uh, I, yeah, so uh, uh, rook d4 is actually probably, it still wins, I'm sure, but I think he didn't play it because of rook c4. Although, I mean, like he did in the game, rook d3, I don't think it makes any difference. It might make some slight difference because the rook operates here now, but I don't think it should matter, actually. But he, he played rook d3 instead. Idea of playing rook g3 and then moving the bishop, and the queen's dead. Yeah. So, bishop d6, stopping, rook g3. So, what's the logical reply for white here? You want to play rook g3, black just played bishop d6. Bishop f4, exactly. Logical. Okay. Yep. Queen h8, just trying to trade queens. Obviously, white does not want to. This clever move, bishop a7, with the point that if black okay. plays king takes, rook h3 is mate. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so it's a double check. Bishop can be taken by, well, here only one piece, but in principle by three, but nothing can be done. King f7, only move, and now white's mating. Again, with the point of this. Uh, ladder mate on the side of the board. Mm -hmm. Actually pretty rare, right? You don't see this very often in a, pe in a board full of pieces. But you know, this is a pretty cool game, uh, especially considering the competitive importance for uh, Karis. Uh, I don't know how to put this in a politically correct way, but it took a lot of guts, I guess that's the right word, to, to play this boldly uh, in this kind of competitive game, right? So, uh, yeah, I'll give Karis kudos for that. Yeah, that's that's all I had. Where that white knight was put at I'm sorry? Right Right here? So So you mean for black here? So black pushed down 
So, uh, black played f6, and then white played queen h5, threatening checkmate. With specifically, if he takes, then bishop h7, and mates. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's why the that's why the knight's immune. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, back to you, Lucas. So just FYI, we've got a fourth game to go, so we're probably going to take about 30 minutes. I apologize for the length and understand, obviously, if you need to get going earlier. But um, I'd like to talk a bit about World War II, a little bit about Smyslov, and then we'll look at a Smyslov game and then uh, wrap it up with any questions you might have. So in, uh, in 1939, prior to the outbreak of World War II, there was some back-channeling between the Germans and the Russians about a non-aggression pact. And uh, that non-aggression pact uh, was, was the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, pact, basically the foreign ministers of both countries agreeing that they wouldn't attack each other. In fact, when Russia attacked Eastern Europe from the West, uh, when Germany attacked from the West, Ru or Soviet Union would attack from the East, and they would, they would split up Eastern Europe, um, and it would make both countries happy, and that was the plan. Although Russia had a secret plans, or sorry, Germany had secret plans all along to invade Russia. They actually weren't so secret because in 1925, Hitler wrote a book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle, and he talks about a lot of things. He talks about uh, his perceptions of the Jews. He talks about you know Aryans and their superiority as a race. He talks about you know, the, the nasty conditions imposed on Germany after World War I and how Germany was going to get revenge. And in that book, he talked about attacking France. He talked about doing something with the Jews. And he talked about um, destroying the Russians. And this was written in 1925. So it really shouldn't have surprised anybody that when he came to power, he set in, in motion events which would do just that. And so, in, on June 21st, 1941, uh, Operation Barbarossa began in which Germ or Germany attacked the Soviet Union, breaking the non-aggression pact, advanced very quickly toward the key cities of the Soviet Union, those being Leningrad, Moscow, and Kiev. Kiev fell, the other two did not, and they were besieged. Now, you should know that Hitler was not interested in Russia surrendering. Hitler was interested in eradicating the Russians. And so that meant a couple of things. First, it meant that if you were a Soviet, a member of the Soviet army or a me member of the Soviet public and you surrendered to the Germans, you were not treated as a prisoner of war under the Geneva Convention. You were put into a prison camp, into a labor camp, and you were starved to death. Three million Germans were, or Russians were imprisoned in these POW camps, and almost all of them, to a man, woman, and child died in them. That was not the way Hitler treated Western soldiers, British soldiers, French soldiers, treated them according to the Geneva Convention. However, he was not interested in obtaining the surrender of the Russians here or the Soviet Union. He was interested in eradicating them, wiping them off of the face of the earth. And that was part of his uh, policy of Lebensraum, which meant to give free land for the good Aryan people to expand eastward. So he invaded, and it wasn't just ideological, it was also strategic. Hitler needed uh, raw goods, he needed grain, he needed food, because the West had imposed a blockade on him and he was having a hard time getting those into uh, Germany. He also needed oil, and the, Russia, or the Soviet Union had many uh, well-developed oil fields, like in Baku, that Germany was going to need to sustain a war effort on the Western Front, much less the Eastern Front. So he invaded. Now, it's worth noting that the Soviet Union actually had their own secret plan to invade and break the non-aggression pact themselves while Russia or Germany was distracted on the Western Front with the Allies, but that, never, that plan didn't get put into motion because they were preempted. So the... Uh, the Germans see, sieged Moscow and Leningrad, and Leningrad was by far the worst. Leningrad was under siege for 872 days, almost three years, including two very brutal winters. And getting supplies into Leningrad was nigh impossible because all land entirely around the city was controlled by the Germans and, and actually the Finns on the north. 
the only way to get supplies and people out of Leningrad was over a lake called Lake Ladoga. Lake Ladoga is located a little bit to the east and it borders uh, St. Peter, St. Petersburg or Leningrad or Petrograd, however you want to call it. Um, and so in the summer they use boats. Like in the top left image you've got boats to ferry supplies into Leningrad. And in the winter they drove trucks over the frozen lake. Now the boats were uh, attacked by German bombers. The trucks were attacked by German artillery because all they needed to do was blast a hole in the ice and the, truck, the trucks would sink to the bottom. There were a lot of people who died in the siege of Leningrad from starvation, from direct combat. Some of the people that died were uh, Vladimir Ilyin Ganevsky, uh, the, one of the founders of uh, Soviet chess and one of the strongest players in the Soviet Union. He died when a ship that he was on was attacked by a German bomber. Uh, Viktor Korchnoi, his father, was in a truck going across the lake when artillery uh, blew a hole in it and his truck sank to the bottom. And so Korchnoi lost his father, who was a decorated um, member of the army, the Soviet army during that siege. And a lot of people died of starvation and of exposure. In the first winter, the winter of 1941 to 1942, 4,000 people per day were dying of starvation or exposure because rations were so severely limited. And this is what the Germans had planned on. They had no intention of accepting a surrender from St. Petersburg. They wanted everybody in there to die because they knew that they couldn't feed a million prisoners and they had no intention of it. So they were just going to surround the city, let them all starve to death, and then not take the city and, and, and loot it. No, they were actually going to use explosives to level it to the ground. They were going to wipe it off the face of the earth after looting all the art galleries and, and former residents of the monarchs, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, brutal, really. The most brutal and costly campaign that's ever been waged in a war ever. So some of the people that died included, uh, well, first of all, the Soviets tried to evacuate as many people as possible. They evacuated all of the women and children that they could, including four-year-old Boris Spassky. He was on a uh, boat that uh, left. Um, Botvinnik was evacuated as well. He did not serve in the war because of his eyesight. Uh, and he was able to get out, not because of his own chess prowess, believe it or not, but because his wife was a ballet dancer and uh, they wanted to save the ballet dancers. So she was relocated and was able to take five members of her family with her. And Botvinnik got out that way. He was on a train that got out about two weeks before that rail line was severed by the Germans and that was the last existing rail line into town. So um, he was one of the last players or one of the last people successfully uh, evacuated. There were a lot of chess players who died of serving in the war. And a lot of chess players who served during the war and lived, for example, I talked about Alexander Kotov during the Al Yakin lecture. He wrote a book, a biography of Al Yakin. Kotov was one of the strongest players in the Soviet Union and uh, probably top 10. And he actually worked as an engineer designing artillery. He designed a breech-loaded mortar uh, for which he received the Order of Lenin, actually. So he was a decorated uh, war hero. And a lot, of other, a lot of other players were as well, and a lot of died on, on the front lines, and history doesn't really remember them. One was Sergei Belovenets, who you probably haven't heard of, but he was champion of Moscow in 1937. Uh, Mark Stolberg, who we haven't heard of in the West, but Bronstein said that Mark Stolberg was the towel of our generation. And many people compared him or compared Kasparov to Stolberg, like their playing styles. But we, we don't remember him and we don't remember his games really because he was a victim of the war. So the, uh, the siege of Leningrad was eventually broken after 872 days, but uh, the consequences were, were great. The toll of, the, of World War II for the Russians was about 20 million people. 20 million people died during World War II in Russia. Many, uh, I mean, a good number of them are soldiers, but many more were just average citizens who, you know, died of exposure or uh, of starvation. Do you remember uh, Romanovsky? He was the first game that we saw tonight. Um, sad story, he was in St. Petersburg during the uh, siege 
And in January of 1941, that first brutal winter, when the average, when the rations that were given out to people, by the way, were 3.5 or 4.5 ounces of bread per day uh, per person, but that was if you could actually make it to where they're handing out the rations, you know, and in the middle of winter when it's 20 below zero, it's not entirely easy. And with bombing raids and everything going on. So a lot of people starved to death, including his wife and his four daughters. In fact, he was found near death by a rescue party and was actually evacuated and ended up making a recovery and, and re entering the Soviet chess scene, but at great cost. And that was really typical of, of almost everybody who survived the, the war. They, they lost something. It wasn't easy on the Germans either. 95% of the casualties of the Germans between 1941 and 1944 were suffered on the Eastern Front with Russia. So devastating for both sides. So uh, one of the survivors and strongest players, and in fact we saw him earlier as the uh, number three on the list, and uh, world champion for a short stint, uh, Vasily Smyslov. Now you may remember I talked about Smyslov's father who took a game off of Alyekin in a simul. Um, Smyslov's father was a master in his own right and taught his son to play at the age of six. And uh, Smyslov did not really want to become a chess player. His passion was singing. So he went to the Bolshoi, which is the famous ballet in uh, Moscow, and he tried out to become a member of their choir as a baritone. Uh, he was rejected, so he fell back on his second love, which was chess. Um, but there are still some uh, recordings of Mark Taimanov, who was a concert pianist, and Vasily Smyslov performing together, him singing and timing off playing the piano. It's kind of cool. Um, so Smyslov was a very, very strong player in his own right. He uh, obviously is world champion. He also holds the record for most medals in a chess Olympiad, something like 17 medals in either individual or team competition. One of the most successful uh, Soviet tournament players of all time. He did win the world championship from Botvinnik in 57. Uh, Botvinnik then got revenge in 1958 in the return match. Incidentally, Tal took the world championship from Botvinnik and I think in 1960 and then Botvinnik got it back in 62, or it was like 62 and 63. So Botvinnik made a couple of comebacks and, and was world champion on three separate occasions. I think that's a, a record still standing. Um, but Smyslov was a, a very strong player in his own right. So for our third, our fourth and final match, let's look at what's considered Smyslov's immortal. This was played against Botvinnik in 1954. And there we go. Thanks, Lucas. So this was from their uh, World Championship match in 1954, and uh, Smyslov really surprised Botvinnik this match by playing the King's Indian Defense for really the first time in his career. He, he may have played it other times, but not seriously. Botvinnik was pretty shocked by uh, this turn of events. I'll just play the first few moves to show you the King's Indian Defense. So this this uh, set of moves by Black playing knight f6, g6, bishop g7, and castles. This is uh, this characterizes the King's Indian defense that I'm talking about. And by the way, colloquially, you might hear people say the kid. They're referring to the King's Indian defense. It's just an anagram. So uh, this was a big surprise for Botsvinnik, especially because the the kid is generally regarded as a pretty aggressive opening, as uh, Kasparov himself refers to it, a man's opening. That's not politically correct, but uh, oh, it's worth quoting. So anyway, let's get to the game. So uh, at the time, there had been a number of games by David Bronstein as on the black side, kind of showing how to play for black, although they were still exploring this. At the time, this was really still kind of new territory. It was kind of a new concept, letting white take over the center with c4, d4, e4, and only then later on getting counterplay. So. Uh, it was still pretty much virgin territory. So nowadays, bishop e3 is pretty much known to be about equal. So instead of this, you'll play h3, which is considered best, or b3, which is also fine. But anyway, so uh, knight g4 is the point, right? Bothering the bishop on e3 is just not stable. So in this kind of position, white uh, really doesn't want to trade that bishop because of the dark squares, right? White has pawns on e4 and c4, 
and white does not want to lose control of those. So white saves it with bishop g5, and now queen b6. It's quickly getting sharp. So this was actually a, a novelty at the time, I believe. Um, or no, not yet. So after white's next reply, h3. This is where Smyslov found the new novelty, and uh, Bavanek was shocked too because uh, Smyslov played these moves instantly with bishop g5, queen b6, and then following here with e takes d4. So uh, this may be kind of surprising because white can win a piece, at least temporarily, with knight a4. Because white's attacking the queen and the knight, so white wins a piece. Just by the way, previously, black had always played knight f6. But it's a bit passive here. Okay. So knight a4, queen a6. Now white, now black shows the point, b5. Forcefully winning back the piece because white's knight is out of squares. So knight takes pawn, b takes, and uh, it, it turns out white's still doing fine here. So a better move for white here would be bishop b7. With the idea of taking on d6 and then trying to fortify the position. For example, say rook e8, bishop takes, knight e5, say c5, something like this. And this is approximately equal, although I, I would be more comfortable playing white personally. But black has a lot of dynamic possibilities here. So anyway, we won't get into the opening debate so much. But Bavinic played knight takes c6. Which uh, does, by the way, win the exchange, but black gets a lot of compensation. So queen takes, e5, skewering the queen and rook. Queen takes, takes, knight takes. So uh, white obviously is uh, having some problems to deal with here. So uh, not only is g4 going to fall, but white's king is also looking a little bit drafty, right? Uh, if it weren't for the light squared bishop, it would look downright terrifying, right? And also this loose bishop on g5 isn't helping matters. But white is, uh, white does have some uh, better possibilities to resist, which we'll show in a minute. So rook c1, maybe four. And uh, here, actually, uh, taking on b2 is maybe not the most precise. Uh, Gasparov points out a move queen b5, which might keep things going a little bit more. Uh, the the reason you'll see in a minute. So uh, queen takes a four, I think is yes, yes. Queen takes a four is fine. Uh, now at this point, yes. So here, white wa was mistaken. Uh, Bodvinik played rook b one. Now this forces black to give up the queen, but he. Uh, did not evaluate correctly the uh, sequence of events. So, uh, peace imbalances at the time. I mean, Botvinnik understood the value of the queen versus rooks and pieces, but really it was still less explored. So, three pieces for a queen. I, I don't know what he thought exactly. I don't think I've seen comments from him, but he must have thought that this was a good deal for him because the result is that uh, black gets uh, these two pieces and. So black ends up with three minor pieces for the queen. So with this intermezzo knight takes with check, then only the next move can black take. So here we have the three pieces for the queen. Now, uh, I was going to talk about an improvement that white had instead, which uh, Bob Vinick was uh, dismissed because he could win the queen. So he could have instead taken on b7 and then played rook c3 and just given the exchange back. And this is probably about equal. After, say, black plays knight f3, he takes, right? So this would have been about equal. So he was not necessarily lost here. But uh, I guess grabbing the queen was too tempting for him. Which, which honestly, I'm a bit surprised because uh, I think most modern-day players here, they would never play a move like rook b1 because you know people value pieces so highly now. So I'm not sure what the exact reason was. So uh, one thing you notice too is the white king doesn't exactly have a whole lot of good squares to uh, to reside in.
so Black is just protecting all his pieces, all nicely coordinated. Now White, White's hoping with this move to be able to play Rook takes d6, but Black doesn't care. Black's trying to go for checkmate. So now Rook takes d6 would be met by just Rook c1. And Black's trying to go Rook h1, Rook h2, and Bishop d4. Well, specifically, for example, say White plays this, then Black has this nastiness. Right? Oh, whoops. I'm sorry, he can just take, actually. Actually, I think this was his idea. Yes. So, this all looks very unpleasant. Right? So, this does not look very good. So, he did not take on d6. Played a5, although at this point it's pretty hard to defend his position. Uh, I don't I don't think I could play king g2 on a, on a full stomach, but I, I guess he didn't bother. And here white just resigned. Uh, one, because he's losing the safe pawn, and two, because whatever white plays, or if I can play bishop d4, and f2 is indefensible. Say, for example, queen g5, something like bishop d4, and this is just defenseless. Black's gonna have a rook swinging on the seventh rank with supporting two bishops, right? So, you know, this is a very pretty game for Smyslov. You know, it's one of the reasons it's considered as immortal is because it's pretty rare to crush Botvinnik back then, much less with Black, right? In a complicated opening like this. And with the material imbalance, it makes it very nice. So, uh, that, was, that was all the comments after that game. All right, so after World War II, uh, the Soviets emerged on the international chess scene, and uh, the first major match they played was in 1945, right after the end of World War II, at least officially, although it had ended in the Soviet Union, you know, almost a year before, essentially. Uh, right after the end of World War II, the U.S. and the U.S.S.R. arranged for a radio match, and actually the second game that we saw, which was Bot Botvinnik versus Denker, was part of that series. And what they did is they took the top ten players from both countries and they, you know, arranged for them to play one another with the moves transmitted by via radio. Now that wasn't a very efficient way to play. Uh, and they had to, you know, it took a lot of time to get the moves communicated, and sometimes there was mistakes, and they had to adjourn several times. But they, they were able to complete the match, and it was very convincing that uh, USSR won that match 15.5 to 4.5. They absolutely crushed the uh, top U.S. players of the day. And this was, this was um, a lightning bolt, really. This was a surprise to the world. It was not a surprise to the Soviet Union. They knew that they had very strong players, and uh, they knew that they had uh, continued to to play chess to the extent possible during the siege and during the war. But the point remained was that they were much they emerged much much stronger in chess than the rest of the world. And this was match. This was corroborated by matches that they played over the board, both against the United States, uh, where I think the score is something like 13.5 to like 7.5 or 6.5. So it was, it was closer, I guess. Um, uh, and they played in England, and they crushed them like 15 to 5 or something. But So it was corroborated by both uh, team battles, you know, nation versus nation, and also in the uh, World Championship. Now, you remember that uh, Al Yakin died in 1946, and that left the World Championship vacant, and there was not a world champion for, um, for a little two-year time period. And so FIDE, who had existed since the mid-20s, in which Russia joined in the late 40s, had to decide how to proceed. And what they decided is that they were going to take the, you know, who was considered the top five players at the time, three Russian players, three Soviet players, uh, one American player, and one Dutch player. 
and Ova, and they were going to put them all in a tournament, a quintuple or five round robins. They all played each other five times. And the result of that was a convincing win for Botvinnik. And so he became world champion, and the world championship would not leave Soviet hands until uh, Fisher, and then it would return to Soviet hands, where it has largely remained, uh, or largely remained for the remainder of the 20th century. So from 1948 on, there was, I guess, a four-year period where Fisher was world champion, maybe three-year period where Fisher was world champion. But other than that, it was pretty much in, in Soviet hands for the remainder of the time. So when asked why the Soviets were so dominant, because some people think, well, it's because they had uh, government sponsorship of the chess. Yes and no. They weren't really professional players. They had a stipend, but they also had a day job, right? Some people say it's because of the chess schools. Yes, but those weren't really established until the 60s, and they didn't really succeed, and, and they weren't really reestablished until Fisher won, and that shook things up, and then the Soviets made a concerted effort to start training the youth in chess. That's when the Botvinnik school and the Petrosian school, the, that's when they were firmly established, and they started training up the Karpovs and the Kasparovs of the future. Um, really, if, if we had to distill it down to one thing, I think Karpov nailed it. He said, uh, he said, it's simply because we have such a lot of people playing chess. So Asolta says it was a huge talent pool. Chess was emphasized in Russia and the Russian Empire as an activity of the aristocracy and of the bourgeois. In the after the Bolshevik Revolution, it became an activity of the workers, and you had hundreds of that, literally hundreds of thousands of com people competing in chess tournaments in the Soviet Union in the early 1920s. You had a um, you had government sponsorship from. Uh, the the Communist Party, and then you had strong chess players, which were strongly encouraged, if you will, to transmit their knowledge, both through books and through training, to the next generation of Soviet champions. Now, was there collusion in in certain tournaments? You know, was there political pressure for this to happen or that? We'll get to that in subsequent lectures. Uh, next month, we'll talk about Tall, who is one of the I think most interesting uh, players in terms of his, his playing style, and and we'll see he has an interesting biography as well. The Magician of Riga, he's or he's known as. So we'll we'll examine him next month. Now, any questions about the games or the the history that we've gone over today? No. Well, yeah. Can you get some more about uh, earlier making the reference to uh, Bakhmovic at some point favoring Kasparov. Yes. So uh, this comes up in Guinness Sasanko's book, uh, which is this one, The World Champions I Knew. And if I could find it real quick, I will read you that particular section because he states it uh, quite well. By the way, I'll, I'll go ahead and yep, sure. briefly. So. Uh, one of the reasons that Kasparov accounts for Bobinik favoring himself or Karpov is because Bobinik was irritated by Karpov's laziness because Karpov would not study openings. That's exactly just right. pissed Bobinik off to no end. You know, he'd, he'd visit Karpov late at night, he'd be playing cards or something. Like, why aren't you studying the Rui Lopez? You know? <laughs> I don't want to, that's boring. But it kind of pissed Bobinik off. So that's according to Kasparov anyway. Yeah, at Sasanko says something much the same. He doesn't really talk necessarily about the openings, but what he talks about is um, how the uh, the Soviet government essentially got behind Karpov and wanted every chess player essentially to prepare briefs or files, a s sort of summaries, if you will, to help Karpov prepare to defend his title and to uh, play very well internationally. And, um, and he, he made a distinction between chess players and chess researchers. He really respected people who studied chess thoroughly. And he talks about uh, some of the people who uh, 
uh, took this, he, he calls it a scientific approach. And he talks about, for example, Ruben Fine, the, the American player who composed in-game studies. He talks about Fine and how he respects Fine as a, uh, a scien uh, someone who studies chess scientifically, as opposed to, say, Tal, who, um, according to Botvinnik, never studied chess seriously. Um, and he, he was... Uh, he was he was very critical of people who did not work very hard, and who just relied on raw talent. Um, he says uh, he says this is from Sasanko. Today Kasparov is the only one who can win the chess crown. Only he is in condition to battle Karpov, and battling will be easier for him than, say, for Korchnoi. The entire chess elite, which Karpov has been able to organize in his time, will not be working against the young Kasparov, and so we shall see what Karpov is capable of when new ideas are not handed to him on a platter. You won't get anywhere against Kasparov on pure talent. Here you need lengthy and painstaking work. But Karpov himself is incapable of working. You can't even make Rochal, who writes books for Karpov, get him to work on chess theory. By the way, these are all just predictions. Kasparov is still quite young, although he explodes into battle like a mature man. No one makes a song and dance about Karpov anymore. Today, he has a worthy opponent who also represents our country, an opponent who has won the hearts of fans and qualified chess players. I think that the situation will not unfold in favor of Karpov, who will only have a few supporters if Kasparov wins out in the candidates' matches. So, uh... But Minnick didn't pull any punches in his criticism of Karpov. And by the way, that was published in an immigrant newspaper in the United States, and it earned Botvinnik a summon uh, in front of the kind of the Minister of Propaganda in the Soviet Union. And Botvinnik really didn't care because uh, he had enough clout, if you will, to get away with saying something like that. So he didn't, he didn't pull any punches. Uh, against uh, with his opinions of Karpov and, and to a certain extent or to a big extent he got away with it as he did in all of his chess career despite being a former member of the bourgeois class and a Jew and, and someone who wouldn't get on the bandwagon you know with, with the communist party on certain issues you know he, he forged his own path I guess you could say out of stubbornness and, and hard work Any other questions? So you didn't read any theories about vodka contributing to the uh, <laughs> chess elite in Russia? No. Um, there was, or about I, the cold weather forcing them to go indoors and come up with something to do other than drink? No, but I, I have seen videos. There's a video out there, I don't know if you've seen it, of Karpov. Uh, playing chess next to a frozen body of water, and what he does is he he strips to his you know his speedo essentially, and he and he goes into the uh, the frozen lake essentially that that's had the top layer like chipped off, and there's a board set up right next to it, and he emerges on the other end, and he plays a move, and he has a big shot of vodka as he's in this frozen water, and and so I, I don't I, I think that's that's kind of part of the culture, right? The 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 hardy Russian you know who who drinks a lot and uh, and plays chess it's kind of a stereotype right <laughs> um, so maybe he didn't work very hard but my gosh he had a certain resistance to cold <laughs> so, uh, all right well I brought my books with with me uh, in case you wanted to take a look I, I would particularly recommend the Solstice book which I used more than any other by the way let me sorry let me go to my references. Um, the Soviet Chess, 1917 to 1991 by Soltis. It's actually the same company that did the book on Nimsevich that I found so helpful, this Mark McFarland and company. And I've really just discovered them through the lectures I've done, but the hardbacks that they do are of outstanding quality. They're kind of costly, but the, the quality of the content is excellent. So I'd highly recommend uh, them. And I've also got the Nimzovich book listed third on this because I took a cross table from there. But most of the cross tables that I obtained and a lot of the information I obtained was actually from the Soltis book. What about the Sasanko book? That just this little points that you referenced sounds really interesting. Yeah, he wrote The World Champions I Knew and I got this when I was doing the Al Yakin lecture because there's a chapter in here on Al Yakin even though the two never met. Um, Sasanko claims he kind of knew him indirectly, and he's he's got a chapter on um, let's see, Capablanca, Yekin, Ova, Botvinnik, Smyslov, Tal, Petrosian. He's actually got three chapters on Petrosian. I guess he he was um, 
quite close to him, and then it stops. It stops there, so it doesn't go to Fisher or Korchnoi or uh, or Karpov or, or Kasparov. So it stops there. But I got it because I thought that it would come in handy for several different lectures and several different preparations. Yeah, and it's it's basically just him writing it. So it's you know from someone who who lived during that time period. I also have the Kotov book, who was a prominent player at that time, um, but. The way the book is edited and laid out isn't isn't very good, but but the information's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yep. You're welcome. <laughs>